When last we left our young wizard hero, the Order of the Phoenix had triumphed over a villainous band of Death Eaters in the Department of Mysteries, but at the tragic cost of his godfather's very life. Can the boy who lived and his cohorts defeat he who must not be named? Who is the Half-Blood Prince? Do you seek the Hallows or the Horcruxes? What did the filmmakers leave out of the adaptations and why is that significant? To answer all these questions and many more, with no restraint on spoilers, we take you now to the thrilling conclusion of Cinefix's three-part Wizarding World extravaganza. What's the difference? Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Hallows. Man, you didn't leave anything for me to introduce, did you? Nope. Well, I'll just jump in here while I've got the chance to remind everybody that this is not an exhaustive list of every single change from the book to the movie, because there are enough of those to fill a vault at Gringotts. We're focused more on the significance of the changes made to the final two books and three movies in the Harry Potter franchise. So, if we look at years one through three as thoroughly setting up the Wizarding World and placing our heroes squarely in the middle of its central conflict, years four and five are about transitioning Harry and the gang from children to adult, then years six and seven have to be about our main characters becoming fully realized heroes, right? <laughs> That's right! And the Half-Blood Prince settles right into that plan. The novel opens with the Muggle Prime Minister receiving a visit from two wizards. First, the outgoing Minister of Magic Cornelius Fudge, then the newly elected lion-like Minister Rufus Scrimger. The wizards bring the Muggle PM up to date on all the recent craziness spilling into the Muggle world as a result of the open war with Voldemort. The movie, on the other hand, skips straight to seeing the craziness. The film opens on Death Eaters kidnapping the wand maker Ollivander and tearing an iconic London bridge to pieces. As we've seen with previous installments in the franchise, layering texture onto the Wizarding World has not been a priority in the film series since the first few films, so this cut is no big surprise. However, immediately following the attack on the bridge, we find Harry hanging in a cafe in the underground, cruising for waitresses before Dumbledore comes to fetch him. I fear I may have stolen a wondrous night from you, Harry. She was, truthfully, very pretty, the girl. It's all right, sir. I'll go back tomorrow, make some excuse. The book sees Harry whiling away the end of the summer at the Dursleys when Dumbledore shows up, of course sending the Dursleys into a tizzy. So right off the bat, movie Harry is shown to be out on his own, less dependent on adults than his book counterpart. Even the bit about how Harry is protected from Voldemort while he can call the Dursleys home is removed from the movie. This guy is officially no longer sitting at the kids' table, you know what I mean? From there, several scenes play out largely the same. Dumbledore and Harry recruiting Professor Slughorn, Bellatrix and Narcissa making the unbreakable vow with Snape, the gang spying on Draco sneaking off to Borgen and Burks. Although in the book, Draco sneaks off by himself, as opposed to being accompanied by his mother and Fenrir Greyback in the movie, which is a difference that has the opposite effect from putting Harry off on his own. Whereas book Draco is taking it upon himself to plot his nefarious plans while book Harry is sheltered at the Dursleys, movie Draco is still chaperoned and movie Harry's doing his own thing. And it doesn't stop there. When Harry sneaks into the Slytherin car on the Hogwarts Express with Peruvian instant darkness powder, only to be discovered and subsequently face-stomped by Draco, <coughs> it's fellow Dumbledore's army alum, Luna Lovegood, who finds Harry hidden beneath his invisibility cloak. Hello, Harry. Luna, how do you know where I was? Raxperts. Your head's full of them. She escorts him up to the school, even fixes his nose after they run into Malfoy at the gates, being shown through the security checkpoint by Snape. Book Harry is discovered on the train by Auror and Order of the Phoenix member Tonks, who, now stationed in Hogsmeade, came looking for him when he didn't show up to the feast. Then Snape meets them at the gate to escort Harry the rest of the way to the castle, and take 50 points from Gryffindor like a slimy little jerk. So, here we have another change that makes the movie good guys less beholden to adults, and the movie bad guys more so. Meanwhile, Draco's plans are going just as poorly in the movie as they do in the book. The cursed necklace lands Quidditch star Katie Bell in the hospital wing, the poisoned mead ends up nearly doing in a love potion addled Ron, even Slughorn's Christmas party and Draco's gate crashing play out the same way. However, over the Christmas break, we find another significant change. While Harry is staying with the Weasleys, the burrow is attacked by Death Eaters. In fact, it's kind of exploded by Death Eaters. And that's a change I personally can't get behind, but more on that later. Tease. But in the book, Christmas Break instead finds the new Minister of Magic popping in to visit Harry at the Weasleys instead of a violent pair of Death Eaters. Scrimger attempts to recruit Harry to be the Ministry's poster boy for the war on Voldemort. 
Of course, Harry refuses, and while it certainly reads as Harry firmly standing up for himself, there's more than a little childish anger in his tone. Leaving this scene out of the movie keeps the focus on Harry coming into his own as an adult, as opposed to feeling all dangsty against authority figures. You have to realize who you are, Harry. I know who I am, Hermione, all right? Sorry. Another difference where this is evident is in the trimming of the Poncier sequences. The book gives much more of Voldemort's background, including the origin of the ring and locket that would become Horcruxes. The movie, though, keeps only the memories directly relating to the job Harry has in front of him. Instead of dropping clues through a year worth of poncieving, movie Dumbledore tasks Harry with retrieving Slughorn's unaltered memory much more directly, treating Harry as more of a partner in the fight against Voldemort. The movie continues to rearrange some events and drop side plots wholesale, as is necessary in adapting 650 or so pages into a two and a half hour movie. While Harry's romance with Ginny is kept in the movie, it's mainly glossed over and still kept secret from Ron in the film. But gone completely are the aberration tests, Harry's employment of Dobby and Creature to follow Malfoy, and of course the bulk of Harry's classes, including one of Snape's defense against the dark arts classes in which he teaches nonverbal spells. Granted, the kids were already using nonverbal spells in the previous film, See also Clint's outrage from the last episode. I stand by that, by the way. But the exclusion of nonverbal spells is very significant in year six. Harry's inability to cast them contributes in part to the ease of Snape's escape after killing Dumbledore. Harry shouting all of those spells at him not only gives Snape something to needle Harry with, it also allows Snape to reveal himself as the Half-Blood Prince. That he's able to toss spells around without barking them is another example of giving movie Harry more agency, abilities more on par with the of-age wizards he deals with. Truth is, though, there's no real rule regarding which spells are spoken and which are not in the movies. So when he shouts Sectum Sempra at the fleeing Professor Snape, there's no real reason for it other than we as an audience need to hear it to follow the events on screen. It also didn't matter much because, frankly, the movie doesn't make a big deal of discovering the identity of the Half-Blood Prince. In the book, the kids spend a great deal of time wondering who the Half-Blood Prince is. There are even all these trips to the library involved. Harry at one point even wonders if his dad might have been the Half-Blood Prince. The moment of Snape's reveal is very well earned in the book, and in the movie it's just kind of... Uh, who cares? You dare use my own spells against me, Potter? Yes. I'm the Half-Blood Prince. Oh, you're the Half-Blood Prince? Yeah, I'm Santa Claus. Who gives a sh**? But we did cruise past one notable difference that we have to mention. In the book, upon hearing footsteps coming up the astronomy tower, Dumbledore freezes Harry in place, so that no matter how bad Harry might want to intervene, he's powerless to do anything but watch. On the other hand, movie Dumbledore instructs Harry to just stay out of sight, imploring the young wizard to trust him. On first blush, I have to say, I was all like, Tch, no way does Harry just sit there willingly and watch Dumbledore get murdered. But remember, this is movie Harry, not book Harry. The Harry that told off the Minister of Magic over Christmas break that Dumbledore had strung along with tidbits of clues all year has been replaced by a Harry who's been given more agency at this stage. Movie Harry's choice to trust Dumbledore in that moment was just that, a choice. An opportunity never afforded his book counterpart. And so, moving into the seventh and final chapter of his story, Harry is well and truly an adult making his own decisions. So here we go down the home stretch. Now, as The Deathly Hallows was split into two movies, they didn't have to ditch as much plot wholesale as the rest of the films. But the adaptation is still littered with tiny, superficial changes between the significant ones. So again, please forgive us for not mentioning every time Ted Tonks isn't in the movies, or Fenrir Greyback isn't that important in the books. So the book opens with a meeting of the Death Eaters at Malfoy Manor. Snape reports the date and time Harry Potter will be moved, and Voldemort murders the Muggle Studies teacher, then feeds her to his friggin' snake. And he does this in front of all the other Death Eaters, and they're feeling somewhat terrified, but kind of into it. Oh god, no, yes, no, no, yes. The movie version of this scene plays the same, however, it's preceded by a bold, extreme close-up of new Minister of Magic, Rufus Scrimger, which is important only because the film version of Half-Blood Prince didn't bother with him at all, and a real sad montage reminding us that Harry, Ron, and Hermione are really out on their own now, with Hermione wiping her parents' memories and Harry bidding farewell to the Dursleys. One interesting difference that pops up almost immediately is Sirius's mirror. It hasn't been seen at all in the film series until right here, in the first few minutes of the Deathly Hallows 
Mythos Part 1. Of course, the mirror comes in very handy for Harry later on, so it's a difficult thing to work around. It's just strange. The film version of Order of the Phoenix in the Deathly Hallows book came out in the summer of 2007, so it's conceivable, and in my opinion a little short-sighted, that J.K. Rowling didn't tell the filmmakers what an important role the mirror plays in Book 7. At the end of the day, though, it's not like the change broke the movie. It's just a little something to get stuck in the craws of Harry Potter fans. So, moving away from that obviously personal tangent, the beginnings in both book and movie move along basically the same path. Harry leaves the Dursleys, accompanied by six polyjuiced up decoys, only to be attacked by the Death Eaters immediately, with Hedwig and Mad-Eye dying in the action. Then, after regrouping at the burrow, Harry's had enough of people dying because of him, and declares that he wants to take off. Of course, the room full of adults nags him out of it without even empathizing with Harry's concern for their well-being. The movie replaces the room full of adults with just Ron. Harry tries to sneak out, but his best friend catches up with him and quite rationally talks him out of it, again putting all the decision-making in the hands of our young heroes. You may be the chosen one, mate, but this is a whole lot bigger than that. After that comes a long stretch that's basically the same in the book and movie, with only the standard trims that happen in every adaptation. Scrimger gives Harry, Ron, and Hermione the bequests from Dumbledore's will, but book Harry gives them a petulant hard time, as he did in their previous meeting. Bill and Fleur's wedding is the same, but Harry is there as a distant Weasley relation, thanks to some good old-fashioned polyjuice potion. Then the Death Eaters show up. Which, which in the books is the first time the burrow is made unsafe. This is what I was talking about. The burrow has already come under attack while Harry was there in the previous film. This is one change that actually works against the overall theme of the adaptations. The attack on the wedding in the book and Harry, Ron, and Hermione's flight to safety is a moment that cuts them off completely. They no longer have the safety of home to fall back on, as opposed to the movie in which it's not the first attack on the Weasleys' home. Once they retreat to Grimmauld Place, however, the book gets back to sending the old folks around when Lupin stops by to offer his help. Harry turns him down in a fury after learning that Lupin is abandoning his family to offer his services to Harry, but the movie skips this bit completely to keep focus on the kids being in charge of their own plans. The rest of Deathly Hallows Part 1 follows the book very closely, a few minor twists and turns aside. The gang discovers Mundungus Fletcher sold the locket to Umbridge, then they infiltrate the Ministry and recover the Horcrux, only to narrowly escape and splinch Ron while disapparating into the woods. Then they wander around for a while, get all mad at each other because the Horcrux is like, my precious. And then Ron takes off. But after Harry and Hermione return to Godric's Hollow and have an encounter with Voldemort's snake masquerading in a skin suit made of a magical historian, Bethil the Backshot, Ron returns in time to keep Harry from drowning. Hooray! They find the Sword of Gryffindor, kill the first Horcrux, then go to see Xenophilius Lovegood, who makes Hermione read the tale of the three brothers to them all before calling the Death Eaters, and when the kids disapparate out of there, they pretty much immediately run into a group of Snatchers who, in spite of a stinging hex to Harry's face, suspect this bunch is more important, so they take them to Malfoy Manor where... Where they get locked in a dungeon, and using Sirius's mirror that the movie version suddenly had to remember, Harry asks what he thinks is Dumbledore's eye for help, only to have Dobby show up, drop a chandelier, and disapparate them all to safety, but take a dagger in the belly and die tragically, causing Clint to cry, which... <laughs> it's actually not a difference because it happened in the book and movie. That's that's actually true. But if it seemed like we fast forwarded there, it's because we wanted to impress how similar the first half of the book and part one are. The most significant difference in the whole thing is how much of Dumbledore's backstory is left out of Deathly Hallows part one. The book dedicates much more time to revealing the events of Dumbledore's youth. His father imprisoned for attacking muggles, his fight with his brother Aberforth over their sister, and his relationship with the dark wizard Grindelwald. All of these serve to drive a wedge between Harry and his unyielding faith in Dumbledore. I mean, the headmaster even lived in the same village as Harry, and he never even mentioned it. The movie doesn't cut this thread entirely, but it does fade to the background. There's a discussion at the wedding between Harry, Elpheus Dodge, and what we can assume is Ron's Auntie Muriel that forces Harry to question how much he really knew about Dumbledore. But the movie uses it more for Harry to question his ability to do the job as opposed to Dumbledore's motives for making the job so difficult for him. This way, the film franchise, having spent six movies giving Harry the agency to take care of business on his own, keeps the focus on Harry struggling almost exclusively with the task itself over the emotional baggage surrounding it. And so, Deathly Hallows Part 1 ends about two-thirds of the way through the book, with Harry and Ron and Hermione laying low at the Shell Cottage with Luna, Grip Hook, the Goblin, and Ollivander, the Wandmaker. Dean Thomas, one of those precious few students back at Hogwarts, FYI, has also tagged along in the book version, but didn't make the traveling squad in the movie. And again, it's these kinds of superficial changes that make up most of the differences between the second half of the book and the Deathly Hallows Part 2 movie. 
The team pretty quickly decides to break into Gringotts after making a deal with Griphook to trade the Sword of Gryffindor for his help breaking into the bank, and while the journey to Bellatrix Lestrange's vault has a few extra layers of difficulty in the book, the film version and the escape via Pale Dragon is roughly the same. In the aftermath of the theft, Voldemort murders everybody in sight, including Griphook, then we see the Sword of Gryffindor disappear. The book, though, never mentions Griphook again. It could be assumed that he's a victim of Voldemort's murder bombing in the book as well, but I personally like to imagine him chilling at home later on in the book, when the sword suddenly vanishes in Neville's time of need. Oh, but Casey, my boy, we're not there yet. I've got a soapbox with that moment's name all over it. In the meantime, we can fast forward through much of the back half of the novel as the changes, like this grip hook situation we've just described, are pretty insignificant for both plot and character. Harry, after splashing down off the dragon and into the lake, has a vision from Voldemort's mind where he learns the location of the final Horcrux is in fact Hogwarts. And Voldemort knows his secrets out, so they gotta move fast. So they pop over to Hogsmeade, setting off all the alarms, only to be rescued by Dumbledore's brother, Aberforth, who, after a soul-searching conversation, shows them the way into Hogwarts. There's something we need to find. Something hidden here in the castle. And it may help us defeat you-know-who. Right, what is it? We don't know. Once there, it's a bit of a longer walk for Harry to track down the final Horcrux. The Lost Diadem of Ravenclaw! As opposed to the movie where a fellow student Luna Lovegood tells him about the Grey Lady, book Harry talks to Nearly Headless Nick, then the Grey Lady, then Hagrid for a little bit before finally realizing he remembered seeing it last year when he hid the Half-Blood Prince's copy of Advanced Potion Making. While this change feels like a no-brainer trim in the name of screen time efficiency, it does give all the agency back to the young fighters of Hogwarts. The movie also chooses to cut all the talk about underage wizards being evacuated for the Battle of Hogwarts, especially concerning Ginny Weasley. It's just the first years that get hidden, but outside of that, if you've got a wand, McGonagall can use you. Pierre Totem Locomotor! I've always wanted to use that spell. But as for most of the other changes made in the second half of the book, they're mostly about threads that have been left out of previous movies. For example, Percy Weasley comes back into the fold, reuniting with his estranged family, a thread that had been gone completely going back to Goblet of Fire. He appears in the movie, but he isn't actually mentioned. Ron and Hermione's first kiss comes when Ron thinks about getting the house elves to safety, and Hermione snogs him good and proper on the spot. Swing! Giggity giggity. But Hermione's spew movement and general concern for their welfare has also been left out completely. By the time we get to Harry's sacrifice, the only difference is that Book Harry snuck out of the castle under the invisibility cloak as opposed to explaining himself to his friends in the movie, trusting them to know it's the right decision. You know, like adults. The boy who lived, come to die. Then after being hit with a killing curse from Voldemort again, Harry arrives at King's Cross Station for a conversation with Dumbledore. In the book version of the scene, Dumbledore explains all of Harry's nagging worries. Why didn't you tell me more? Were you really friends with Grindelwald? Why'd you make this task so hard? But the movie version, once again portraying Harry as a fully capable wizard, basically just asks him to make a choice. Go on, because frankly you've done plenty, or go back and continue the fight. But, and here's my Neville soapbox, when Voldemort trots out Harry's body in the movie, Neville steps forward and makes a decently lame speech, then just brandishes the sword like it means a damn thing to anybody, only to get knocked unconscious. Oh, you mean as opposed to the book where he rushes at Voldemort only to have the sorting hat forced on his head before being set on magical fire for a minute? Yup. And then he whips out the sword of Gryffindor from said sorting hat and kills the snake like a badass? That's the one. While everybody around him is fighting to the death, movie Neville wakes up in a stupor like one of the Three Stooges and casually grabs at the sword. Yeah, he ends up killing the snake as it's about to strike Ron and Hermione, but this is not a moment befitting Neville. He became a leader, a guerrilla warrior over his final year at Hogwarts, and the movie plays his big moment for laughs. Boo, I say, boo. No other character in the Harry Potter novels gets shortchanged more by the adaptations than Neville Longbottom. There, I said it. Gee, that was quite a soapbox. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna wrap this up though. Probably a good idea. The book's final showdown between Harry and Voldemort takes place in the Great Hall. Harry has produced a shield charm around them to keep any other spectator from interfering. Harry then lays it all out for Voldemort here, including why the Elder Wand doesn't answer to Voldemort. It's a reverse of the classic villain explains everything to the good guy right before the good guy escapes the elaborate death that was planned for him situation. And it's there in front of everybody that Harry defeats Voldemort once and for all. In the movie, their showdown is a much more private affair, the two of them out in the courtyard with Voldemort kind of 
corn flaking apart into ash, I guess you would call it, at the end. He doesn't explain the Wand's allegiance until afterwards to Ron and Hermione. In both mediums, Harry decides he doesn't even want the Elder Wand, although in the book, he tells it to Dumbledore in his portrait. The last bit of the book, the one I like to call Needless Epilogue, is adapted very faithfully to the screen. As our main characters are loading their kids into the Hogwarts Express some 19 years later, we catch up on all the great things our young heroes have grown up to do. The movie version, of course, doesn't get into all of that, but Ron does have a very badly receding hairline now. Then cue the iconic music and fade to black. So that's that. Eight movies, seven books, and three episodes of What's the Difference Later, and we've made it through the wizarding world of adaptations. I frankly don't know what to do with myself now. Indeed. What worlds are left to conquer? Let us know in the comments below, and be sure to like and subscribe for more What's the Difference right here on Cinefix. <laughs>